you see the slide. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Leila Al Hashmi, a chronologist working in Israel Hospital. Today, we are uh, having a, hoping a good evening, inshallah, with uh, uh, Professor Goran Petroski, uh, endocrinologist and diabetologist at uh, Sidra Hospital, Qatar. Uh, we are delighted today to have him have, uh, in our um, session, which is the 11th sessions. Uh, organized uh, by Oman Diabetes Association. And this evening is actually uh, sponsored by Militric. So the, the topic that we are uh, going to uh, have it today, uh, this evening is advanced hybrid closed uh, loop uh, system. Uh, I'm sure it will be so interesting to, uh, to listen to uh, and uh, we start to have good number of participants. Uh, so, we could start, uh, Professor Goran Petroski, in your uh, lecture. Thank you, Leva. Um, good evening. So it's my great pleasure to share with you the advanced hybrid closed loop system focused on minimum 7 APG. I'm really sorry because this um, uh, uh, presentation, it's not face-to-face, -face, but maybe in the future we can organize something which will be in face-to-face. Um, uh, -face. And Lele, Dr. Lele is going to moderate this session. And please, if you have any question or comment, even during my presentation, please just uh, put in the chat box or the Q&A and, and the Q &A box, and then Leila will just raise this issue. So let's start with the presentation. We all know that we have a lot of technology options in the type 1 diabetes. Um, I, will, I tried uh, uh, to organize just to be sure that it will be more understandable even for our patients and also for the healthcare providers. As you can see from the left-hand side, we have the multiple daily injections um, uh, technology. Then we have the open loop system, system that are only for the pump therapy. And then we have the closed loop system. So we all know that the patients who are on the multiple daily injections, they are all benefiting a lot from the real-time CGM. Some of the devices, they can, they can be used as a retrospective device including here the flash monitoring, and then an additional devices that are going to be present in the near future is the Bluetooth pen. It means that the smart pen, which is going to track the insulin levels, and it will be connected together with the, um, uh, with the glucose sensor, which when we download uh, the, uh, the device, uh, uh, actually the pen and together with the sensor, we're going to have the full information from the insulin and from the CGM metrics. So the open loop systems, actually we still have a lot of patients who are using this kind of the system. It can be the standalone pump and then the pump can, uh, the, the patient can use the, uh, the, the self monitoring or the blood glucose um, uh, uh, monitoring systems, or it can be used as uh, other uh, the devices and, and other sensors, but which are not connected. From the other side, it's very familiar with the sensor admitted pump therapy, which means that the sensor will communicate with the pump and it will give us, it will give to the user the information uh, to uh, suspend the insulin before and on the low. But I want to focus on this group, which is pump and CGM devices, because the, the, the patients will choose any kind of the pump and any kind of the sensor, and these devices will not be connected. The problem with this uh, with uh, this um, uh, two devices is that the data from the sensor will not be transferred to the mobile phone or to the pump, and it means that it will not be a benefit in some kind of the automation. Yes, for the patient, it will be much much easier because instead of pricking like the SMPG, they will see that glucose levels on the mobile on, on the mobile phones. 
In the last five years, actually, uh, the, the, the systems, we call them hybrid closed loop systems, it started with automated puzzle, basal insulin delivery, and now we have the, the uh, together with the, with the bonus correction. There are a lot of devices now, as you can see here, there are five plus one different devices that can be used for the, uh, for the automated insulin delivery. I can see that they, uh, they use the different algorithms and actually um, we have to go in details to understand what are the differences between the, uh, with all the systems in order to implement in our uh, practice. We all know that we have the open loop system and uh, that it, it prevents the hypoglycemias but not the hyperglycemias. So what does it mean? You can look at here on the upper part. This is the glucose values during the night from midnight till 6, 6 a.m. So usually when the patients are sleeping, as you can see here that the open loop system pre uh, prevents from the hypoglycemia. Here we have the some suspense before low. It means that the insulin will be delivered here for the uh, before reaching low, and then the glucose level is stay normal. But look at the, on, on, on the bottom um, on the bottom of the screen. When there is a hyperglycemia, there is no protection. So it means that the patient, we, uh, what we usually do, we just put the alarm, we set the alarms so of 200, 250. The patient needs to wake up and to deliver some amount of the insulin during the night in order to decrease the glucose levels on the, with the, uh, to, to the target. We are all familiar with, with this uh, report. This is the sensor emitted pump therapy. And if we go back, uh, we have to look at a lot of information Informations, but to be sure that we uh, we will understand where what to fix. So we have to look at the glucose overlay, the hypo, the hypoglycemic spikes here. We have to look at the basal rates, the bolus insulin that is also delivered. Is it coming from the uh, from the food or also from the corrections? And then we go also on the positive and on the on, and on the negative overlays. How we can improve the glucose control in these patients? It's much, much easier because now we have the automated insulin delivery and we're going to discuss also uh, how we can easily fix this information, uh, this patient because reading the reports and uh, uh, with automated insulin delivery, it's much, much easier from the previous open loop systems. Um, so this is another um, our patient. I can see that, uh, from that uh, with the advanced hybrid closed loop system, we can do the switch. It means that the glucose variability, we will switch to the glucose stability, and then the insulin stability, we go to the insulin variability. What does it mean? It means that this is the patient who is using the open loop system. As you can see here, we have four or five basal rates. So it means that the, almost the insulin is stable during the, during the day. It's, we all know from our practice, we just increase or decrease uh, 10 or 20% up and down during the day, during this, um, uh, during the, uh, the, the basal infusion rates. And then in those cases, especially in this case, we have the high glucose variability. The glucose is going up, there is some corrections here, suspend before low. When this patient was switched to the automated insulin delivery, it's completely different. Look at the insulin variability here. So it means that insulin is delivered every five minutes based on the glucose levels. In some period, there's no insulin here. And then when the glucose is in normal and there's a trend that will increase, the pump, the pump will increase the basal rates and it's needed even in the normal, even with the, with the target, the pump will uh, deliver this uh, bolus correction. So this uh, blue dotted, uh, dotted spots here is the automatic corrections with the millimeter 7 ATG. And then in, in order to have the glucose variability here, then we will stabilize the glucose um, um, the profile, then we have the, 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 the stabilization. So it means that the insulin stability for four or five basal rates goes completely to the insulin variability. Like in this case, look at here, there's no insulin delivery here. And then the glucose variability, we are trying to push it to be more stable. This is the minimum at 780G, all the components that work together. We have the pump, which is similar to 670 to 640G. There's a Guardian 4 transmitter and a Guardian sensor, which is similar with the same shape like the previous one, but this is with the, this is the calibration free sensor for seven days. They're communicating with the pump with the Bluetooth technology. On the other side, we have the aperture guide detector. It means that sometimes the patient wants to check their glucose levels, and this data will come directly um, to, the, uh, to the insulin pump therapy. 
even with the same Bluetooth technology, there is application, Minimet mobile smartphone application, with all the data that are coming on the, on the device, the, 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 the user can see the glucose levels. So in order to this data to be seen on the parents and on the caregiver application, we need to have the internet. Internet can be on the mobile phone or it can use the 4G or the 5G. Please be sure that sometimes your patients will come and say, okay, look, the data is not coming to, 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 to my mobile phone. And then when you check, it can be the problem with the, with the connection here, the, 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 the internet 3G or 4G or 5G is stopped, or is there is no wireless communication. This data using the internet goes to the Kaling server, and in the real time, it goes to the Kaling um, uh, application. Um, from the other side, it means that uh, we don't need to download the data from the pump because if we use the mobile application every 24 hours, usually during the midnight, the data, the full data will be transferred to the Kaling server, which gives us the opportunity to do a lot of virtual visits and close follow-ups. If the patient doesn't want to use the mobile phone on any reason, then we can use traditionally, we can download the pump using this blue adapter. I can see that in Qatar, more than 95% of the up to 98%, they're using the mobile phones um, for the data transfer because it makes our life much, much easier. How the algorithm works? Actually, this is the smart card technology. This is the target that we can set 100, 100 and 120 milligrams per deciliter. And then the pump every five minutes delivers this a small amount of the insulin in order to uh, keep the glucose levels to the normal. If the glucose levels starts to go more than 120 milligrams per deciliter, algorithm by itself, it will start to push with this so-called auto corrections in order to decrease the glucose levels to normal, first to 120 milligrams per deciliter, and then the auto basal will take into consideration. Sometimes there will be no insulin delivery here. How does it look like that in, in, in the real life um, case? This is the same patient. Look at here. So we have 85% time in range in both days. Carbs are carbohydrate intake is almost the same, 200 and two, around 200 uh, grams per day. But look at the differences with the basal, 26% and 42%. And then look at the auto corrections here, 20 and 11, almost double corrections here. It means that the algorithm and the pump is trying the best to keep the glucose levels to the normal. What does it mean that if, well, if the patient needs the bolus? This is the, uh, this is the day with the bolus. And in this case, we have 80% of the time. But sometimes the patient can forget the bolus. If we have the optimal settings, like in this case, which means that if you use in adolescents or adults, uh, active insulin time of two hours and uh, the target 100 milligrams per deciliter, and if there's a missed bolus here, Look at the glucose levels, it starts to go high, but then the pump starts to push with the bolus corrections, with automatic corrections, and after two hours, the glucose levels goes to normal. All these pumps actually are not intended to be used without the bolus. Again, this is how does it look like. The algorithm is trying to push with it all these corrections here to, to keep the glucose levels stable or, or in order to bring it back to the normal glucose levels. So, uh, how we do the device conversational map for the patient with type 1 diabetes at our center. As you can see here, we have the five different drugs. If the patient is on the multiple daily injections, we can offer the patient to stay on the MDI and then to use the SMBG. But then we use the professional CGM uh, retrospective in order to improve. The second group is the multiple daily injections and the real time or the flash glucose monitoring system. Now the track three and the track four are almost, we have less and less patients. That means that it's a standalone pump with the sensor or with the SMPG, or we have the, the sensor limited pump therapy. But in the last five years, actually, we, we were working to, to, de uh, to um, uh, develop uh, uh, the specific guidelines, how to implement the advanced hybrid closed loop and the hybrid closed loop direct transition from the multiple dead injections. And from the other side, the sensor augmented pump therapy compared to the, uh, to the advanced hybrid closed loop system, the cost, the money costs actually are the same. The only difference is in between the initial costs. And this is why actually um, uh, we are trying 
that when we start that to start directly with the closed loop systems. Uh, the settings actually um, now on the pump, it can, uh, uh, when we have the advanced hybrid closed loop for the clinicians, we need to consider only three things. The basal ratio actually is coming directly by the pump and the algorithm. Yes, but from the beginning, we need to pay, so we need to set the basal rates for the first two or three days in order of the, the, the pump to go back to, uh, to, to switch to the automatic modes. The carb ratio which needs to be set can also to be evaluated. The sensitivity factor is taken by the algorithm, active insulin time and the target it needs to be considered and the auto corrections are taken by the algorithm. So as you can see here, if you're using the uh, optimal settings, which are from two to three hours and 100 and 110 milligram per deciliter, we need only to focus on the current ratio. We don't need to take into consideration the basal rates, the sensitivity factor, the corrections doses, because all this is taken by the algorithm. The settings uh, of, the, of the targets, it can be set 100, 110 and 120 milligram per deciliter. Usually we go with 100 and 110 milligram per deciliter. We can say that Usually we don't use any more 120 milligram per deciliter, even for the small kids. Uh, uh, for adolescents and adults, usually we, we go with 100 milligram per deciliter. Temporary target can be set to 150 milligram per deciliter without the uh, corrections, and it's in use actually for the exercise. Uh, this is how the pump looks like from the patient perspective. As you can see here in the grid is the uh, is the timing targets for 7 to 180 milligram per deciliter. We can see here that this is the glucose levels in the target and these pink lines here is the auto basal and these are the corrections, which means that the pump is trying to get to the normal glucose levels. So in the, past, in, in, in the last five years, we have a huge experience with the hybrid or plus hybrid closed loop. And usually we're trying to develop the, the guidelines the, the, to switch from the, the easy switch from the, uh, from the multiple day injections to the advanced hybrid closed loop. So we can perform a study uh, on the 10 day initiation protocol. This was used for the previous study, but now we adopt it for the seven ATG to evaluate the 10 day initiation protocol. It was prospective, single center, single arm study, and the primary outcome was the timing range uh, from the baseline in the first three months with the extension phase of the, uh, of the nine months. As you can see here that uh, we uh, recruited uh, uh, the uh, children from seven to 17 years old. The age was 12.5 years. So these are actually almost adolescents. And as you can see here that the uh, initial a one the baseline a one was 8.6, uh, 8.6. And I can say that this study actually was started during the COVID times. And we were a little bit um, um, uh, wondering why the A1C was 8.6. And then we look at the data of the hemoglobin A1C uh, from the, before the COVID in the, in the same patient cohort, it was 8.5. So it, this is also reported that during the COVID times, uh, for, especially for the patient using the multiple daily injections, that they will increase the, uh, the hemoglobin A1C and the glucose control can be deteriorated. So it was a huge challenge for us to perform the study during the COVID times. Most of the visits, especially from the follow-ups, were performed during the uh, online. And sometimes when we have the face-to-face -face training, we have to switch to the virtual because um, if some of the patients got the COVID uh, um, uh, in, in, in that specific period, uh, period. This is maybe one of the most important points uh, uh, of the time ranges over the time. As you can see, baseline was the time in the range of 42%, it was below 50%. When we started the sensor admitted pump therapy, the open loop, we increased it to 50, 54%. And with the automation here, you can see here that after the two weeks, we reached the target for more than 70%. And after that, um, the, the second and the third month, we managed to keep the time in the range around 80%. The hypoglycemic events, they stay to the low and they met the international consensus for the, for the uh, uh, glucose uh, targets. This is the initiation protocol we're going to discuss after I present the study. Uh, in short, it consists of four different uh, steps. The first step is the introduction session. The second one is the training 
on four consecutive days at the clinic. Then we have the three days of the menial mode. So that means that we put um, uh, the, all the settings in the pump here, and then uh, the automation for the next um, eight, uh, the 84 days, which is around three months. This is also um, an important slide, which shows the strengthening of the carb ratio. And actually, this is what I want to stress here, that when uh, we switch the patient for the multiple daily injections, usually when we have the higher A1C, please be sure that to decrease the carb ratio to the optimal control. In our study, the baseline uh, carb ratio in these adolescents actually 12.5 age uh, years was the age in our cohort, it was almost 15 grams, we decreased it to 8.5. So the algorithm by itself, actually, it needed to be, we needed to change the carb ratio to lower the carb ratio for more insulin in order to have the better, uh, the, the, the better um, um, results. Don't worry, the basal the bolus ratio actually is the same. So the total the daily dose, uh, it will not be, um, it will not be um, increased. And also the active insulin time, as you can see here, that usually in our cohort, we use the uh, target of 100, almost 60, 60%, and another 40% they were using 110 deciliters. Only one patient ended up with 150 deciliters with the active insulin time is more prominent. 70% of our cohort of our individuals use the active insulin of two hours, and only um, only uh, thirty percent they use two to three two, two to three hours. We also performed the, the, the diabetes technology satisfaction questionnaire for both participants and parents. You can see here that uh, in both groups the, the the score was increased, and which was very very significant. The uh, Quality of life improved. So the effect on parents' life was improved by significant 1.6 points, which means that the parents were, were reporting that now they can uh, normally sleep um, during, the, uh, during the night. These are our endpoint results. You can see here that we started with 42.1% 40, time target range. We ended up with 78.8 for the three months period. The time below the range remain low with the target. As you can see here, the A1C from 8.6 decreased to 6.5, amazing 2.1, 2.1 decrease in the first three months. On the average, around 79 of the, of the participants, they achieved the, uh, the target of A1C below 7%, and 78.8% was the average of the time in the range, and actually, uh, uh, more than 70% of the time in the range, it was, um, it, it was seen in 74% of the participants. From another point, we didn't uh, uh, note it hypoglycemic events, uh, severe hypoglycemic events, or the DKAs, or the hospital admission due to the, the, uh, due, due to the minimum 7 ATG. So the take home messages for this system that it demonstrated to be safe in order that we didn't have any hypoglycemic events or the ketoacidosis. It provides significant cl cl clinical improvements in both A1C and the timing range. So we ended up with 6.5 the, the A1C, and also it was found that improvement of the quality of life in both children and adolescents and the caregivers. All participants spent a high percentage of the time in the auto mode. And this is another point that it needs to be stressed in order to have the better glycemic control, we need to stay in the in the smart guard and also the better outcomes are achieved when using the advanced hybrid closed loop in the optimal settings even this were the patients this were the individuals the adolescents we use the target of 100 milligram per deciliter and active insulin time from two to three hours so let's discuss now about the protocol by itself this is the four step approach and let's go now with in details how does it look like so this is what we are doing. The, the, the first step actually is introduction session. What does it mean? It means that the, the patients who are interested for the minimum 7 ATG or the patients that as a health providers that we want to put them on the pump, we invite them on the introduction session. The introduction session actually it's, it's, it's uh, held on, on every second Thursday at 9 a.m. in the morning. And it means 10 to 15 
of the individuals with type 1 diabetes together with the parents, they will come uh, here and we are going to discuss um, all the responsibilities and all the expectations. Those who will meet the criteria, they will be scheduled for the PAM school. These are the four consecutive days. Three days after, the manual mode will be initiated on Wednesday at midnight, at noon, sorry, uh, the smart guard will be activated. And then we have the weekly virtual visits in order to, um, uh, to evaluate the results. So on the calendar view, you can see how structured is this protocol. And actually all these clinics actually are built up in our system and uh, uh, health providers together with the educators and the, and the dietitians and also the physicians, they know which day, what they need to do. This is the first step, as you can see here, we call it fill the pump. So all, the, uh, all this uh, group of the patient, they will have the opportunity to ask the questions and to discuss about the expectation from the system because some of them, they, they, they think that this system is uh, only, is fully automated. And then the patient responsibilities, that they need to change the infusion set, they need to troubleshoot sometimes, and then they need to do the calculation with the curves, and they need to bolus. And also we discuss the connectivity and also the timing range concept. So the system readiness assessment was is the curve counting, the bolus for food, and also the sensor calibrations if needed. Now, because we have the garden tour sensor, this actually is dropped out. Bulls for the carbs, it's very important. And now the carb counting, because we had, and in this part, we have presented a new study that we have performed another study, which shows that the patient, even with the proper carb counting, if they don't know how to, uh, to calculate the carbs, we can, uh, we can switch to the, uh, uh, to the minimum 7-8-G. Now we are restructuring our program that it will allow the, those patients who are not doing the carb counting to initiate the 7 g the four consecutive days starts from Sunday till Wednesday. This is two to three hours per day group session, which means that three patients are coming at the clinic or it can come virtually. And we start the sensor and the connectivity on the on, on first day. And this is actually all the points that are discussed and that are evaluated for the competency before ending the day four. Then the sensor automated pump therapy, we start in, uh, uh, three days because in order this system to, um, to run in automatic mode, we need to set the basal rates, the targets, the calibration, the sensitivity, and the activity time. In our center, it's only three days. And after three days, we initiate in the smart guide, the, the smart guide. These are the Kerlik report, reports. And I want to mention here that uh, usually we are looking at the carb ratio and we are recalculating. The quick tip for this, we can use the 360 rule for 350. Sometimes for small children, we use even the 200 rule divided by the total daily dose. The follow-up visits, uh, actually we are evaluating the, uh, the percentile comparison, the, the sensor and the, pro the progress report and the weekly review. These are the most important um, uh, uh, reports that need to, uh, need to be evaluated. Then we can go on the daily, we can evaluate the post meal, and also we can go on the daily basis. During the COVID time actually, we performed also the virtual initiation uh, protocol. It means that we use the same protocol, the same um, calendar view, but we added two different, uh, uh, two different uh, uh, sessions. It means one is the technical readiness. It means that we want to be sure that the patient is ready technically um, uh, ready to go with the virtual, it means that the patient needs to have the laptop before the video, the good internet connections, the email, they, they have to know how to use the Scout, uh, the, the Skype account, Zoom, and we also create the, the Kalec account. The pump pre-training actually consists of the several user guides and videos that needs to be watched before um, the commencing the training. And there's also the, the session specifics. It means that the assessment is uh, virtually because it's it's online is uh, is performed uh, using the pre-recorded videos for the patients. The education, it, the training is given in the new topics in the six seven and the seven G. and then the our educators are giving them the homeworks. It means that they need to read specific topics in the user guide. Right? They need to watch specific videos and they need to practice and record specific tasks. Let's say how to change the infusion set, how to insert the 
uh, the, the sensor, how to boost, how to change the carb ratio, because these are the practical sites that we can change when the patients are not coming in the clinic, we can change it also virtually. And these are the two different uh, uh, protocols we have, that we have published is also online. You can find it also uh, uh, online with the 670 and the 70G. How does it look like? How does it, how did this protocol works uh, in order to improve the glycemic control? Now let's discuss about one of our 15 year old uh, patient. Uh, can we see if we have any questions? Yeah, uh, can we? Yeah, yes. yes, yes, actually, yeah. First of all, thank you so much for this uh, enlightenment. Um, uh, we have here one question saying, uh, is there any autobasal delivery if the blood glucose is below the target? Yes, this is a very good uh, question. Um, so um, if we are going, I can see from the open loop minded understanding, because usually yes. we are uh, thinking about the 640, the VO pump that when the pump will be suspended before load, the pump will stop the insulin delivery. So now with the closed loop mind setting and evaluation, it's completely different. Uh, you, you have seen also on the previous slides, when we show how the system actually, how the algorithm works, even when the glucose levels are in the normal values, the pump every five minutes calculates which amount of the insulin can, uh, should be delivered. Sometimes on 110, 120 milligrams per deciliter, there will be zero basal. If the sugar starts to go high, higher, the pump will start to give a small microboluses. And then all this algorithm, which has its own algorithm curve, the learning curve, calculates the dose of the insulin. So in some period, when you have the normal glucose levels, you will see, let's say 15, 20, 30 minutes without the basal insulin because the pump is recalculating the insulin dose. So consider that there is no fixed basal rates. There are only microboluses that are delivered. And this is why I have said that, you know, this insulin variability, that every five minutes, the insulin can deliver 0 0.1, 0 0.6, one unit or zero insulin. Units. And when we, when we discuss, well, when we show the cases, we're going to go uh, back to see how does, does this look like. All right, uh, you might carry on. Uh, probably one, one question, but probably I can put it at the end of the, your, yes. uh, your okay. talk, yeah. Okay, okay. And please, if you have any questions, any, any comment, please go with the Q&A box, uh, chat box, and please put it there because we want to make it um, you know, um, as interactive as possible. So let's go now with Emma. Emma, it's a 15 year old girl. So you can see she has diagnosed, uh, we have diagnosed uh, type one diabetes at the age of nine. Currently she was using the MDI with the intermittent flashing and intermittent scanning. Total daily dose 56 units, 0 0.8 units. Uh, long acting is 28 units, carb ratio of six. Sensitivity of 30 and the target of 110 uh, milligrams per deciliter, no complications. Her A1C is, I can say, fair, 7.7, not so good. And she's always having from 7 to 8.8 .8 in the last two years. She's a very precise person and dedicated person. And she has a regular physical activity, good basketball and yoga. So, what are our challenges? She is overwhelmed with her diabetes management despite her high engagement. And what she said that I'm following the plan, but my sugars are not good. Everything I'm doing is wrong. So as you can see here, she is very precise and she's dedicated. And let's see how does it look like. Look at the AGP report. This is when she was in the multiple daily injections. We achieved to go with 58% low hypoglycemic, and this is the AGP report. You can see here that sensor active, it's 100 milligram, 100%. Uh, so she, she is scanning, she's scanning 10, 12, 15 times per day. And this is what we're asking for our patients. The GMI, the estimated table is 7.5, not so bad. But when you look at here, there's some hyperglycemia here. And then also we try to increase the basal rate, and we have some hypoglycemias. Then we decrease the carb ratio even for more insulin, 
like in this case, and then we have hypoglycemias here. This is another report, 99% sensor active, GMI 7.2, 64% time in range. So we were not getting to the uh, control. And when we analyze the literal report on the daily uh, view, we can see that this is completely disappointing, not only for her, but also only for us for the, as a health providers. Look at the boxes here. There's a hyperglycemia here, one day with almost good glucose control, and the next day hypoglycemia is here, the next day hyperglycemia is in the afternoon, hyperglycemia in the morning, low glucose levels here. So the whole roller coaster here. She's doing the proper uh, carb counting. As you can see here, she's entering everything on the device in order to see the insulin, the boluses that are also delivered here. And then the question that we want to ask, and then we are going to discuss this, is what is the therapy modification? Should we refer to diabetes indicator clinic? Maybe frequent visits to change the dosing, start the real-time CGM, or maybe to start the closed loop system. So let's try to answer all of them. If we go to the diabetes and educator and the dietitian uh, 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 clinics, we did that one several times. She's very precise, she knows how to do it. So this is not, it, she will not benefit a lot. Frequent visits to change the dosing, this is what we have done. Start the real time CGM comparing with the flash monitoring. We don't think so that it will add a lot of value because now she's using the vibrator with suspend, with, with, with alarms on high. It means that she's using that, that, that information in order to decrease the glucose values. So what we did in this case, we have started the start of the, the closed loop system. So how we can start? We can start on the different ways, short and concise, three to four days. We can use our initiation protocol and there are other centers who uh, reference the, the, the protocols that uh, CGM for six weeks before switching to the uh, 780 g all training in open loop for the with the predictive low glucose suspend for the six weeks before switching to the minimum 780 g Doesn't matter which way you're going to use. I believe that you should find the proper way, the, 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 the protocol, the program that will work the best for you. For us, we have created the 10-day initiation protocol, which is short, concise, and we also use momentum of the patient's motivation in order to jump to the automated insulin delivery. And then we can see the results, the good results in the first couple of, um, uh, couple of weeks. This is the protocol, how does it look like? And the beauty of this protocol that we can, that at Sidra, we're using the same protocol for any therapy that you want to switch to the 780G. What does it mean? It means that if we have the patient who is on the multiple daily injections and the SMBG or the CGM, then we use the full protocol. Introduction session, four consecutive days of training, three days in the medial mode, and then automated insulin delivery um, for uh, 84 days with all these uh, visits. But when you have the patient who is transiting from the open loop system, standalone system, then we need the introduction session because we need to be sure that the patient understand what is the meaning of the automatic insulin system. But then we can decrease the training in three days. Other two steps are the same. When the patient is transiting from the sensory emitted pump therapy, let's say the VO pump with the suspend on low or the 640G with the suspend before low, again, we need the introduction session to, uh, uh, to be sure that they have the full understanding, and then the training we do only into two, say, in two sessions. Other two, set, uh, uh, other two uh, uh, steps are the same. But when we have the patient who is uh, upgrading from the minimum 670G, we don't need introduction session and we need only one session and we do it virtually. Now in Qatar, actually, we have a lot of patients who are switching from the 670 to the 780G and almost all patients who are using the previous system we set some goal that in the next following months, all of them, they're going to use the new 780G. Why we decided like that? Because the 780G by itself 
has the opportunity with the upgrade, to, to upgrade the software. So what does it mean? It means that, let's say that the next year there will be the new pump, let's say 780 or uh, 820 uh, model. So it means that we don't need to change the hardware. We can upgrade the software on the current pump and immediately we're going to be on the same, on, on the new device. So this structured approach, we use it to switch any background therapy to the minimum 780G. How long the patient should stay in the sensory limited pump therapy? There are different protocols for us, two to three days, it's enough. We use it three days from the practical points of view because this is built in our clinics. Usually starting uh, on, uh, we start the smart, the, the, the medium load on Sunday at noon time, and then we switch the smart guard on Wednesday because uh, the clinic is there. Usually now with the 780G, we switch to the smart guard, usually online, we do the virtual clinics, the patient will stay at home or at the school, and they can use the automated um, insulin delivery, even uh, without coming to the clinic to initiate uh, only for, for, this, uh, for this point. This is Emma, the three days on the, on the sensor augmented pump therapy. As you can see here, she's wearing the sensor 80%. Timing range increased slightly to 72%. And we said, okay, let's, this is the glucose profile. Let's initiate the, uh, let's initiate the, the, uh, the automated insulin delivery. So the question now that we want to ask is what kind of the settings that we can use? The active insulin time two hours or 100 milligram per deciliter. As we can say that we can set the active insulin from two to three hours and target from 100 or 110 milligram per deciliter. So we usually we are in this area here. What we did, usually directly now, we are so confident to start the automated insulin delivery with two hours of active insulin time and the target of 100 milligram per deciliter for all adolescents, uh, which means that age from more than 12 or 13 years old. For those who we are maybe hesitant to start with the optimal settings due to possible hypoglycemia, then we use the active insulin uh, time of three hours, 110 milligram per deciliter, but then we found tune in the first two weeks in order to go to the optimal settings. This is the second week. As you can see here, we uh, went to 81% without the hypoglycemic events. And we said, yes, we need to bolus before the meal. There's a slight increase here up to 10 millimoles during the night, but this is not significant. This is why we said we don't make any changes. We just ask to bolus before the meal. This is the recommended settings actually that uh, from the real world, which shows that most of the users are using these settings, 100 and 110 milligram per deciliter and the active insulin of two to three hours. In our study, it was the same. Uh, it means that we were using the, the, the optimal settings. The second point is that we want to stress, and this is becoming very, very important, that we need to recalculate the carb ratio. Usually we are using the rule of 360 divided by the total daily dose. What does it mean? It means that this is the carb ratio that we want to aim to go with that. So let's say that you have the patient who is using the carb, the carb ratio of 15 grams. With the calculation of 360, let's say that you need to calculate like eight. 15 to eight, it's too drastic change. We said that, okay, let's start with 12. And it will give you a clue that in order to improve the glycemic control, maybe you should go to 11, 10, 9, or 8 in, in, in the future. And we also noticed that a lot of patients, especially those with of, of age of 12, they're using the carb ratio of 8, 9, 10, sometimes 7, that in the beginning, it was a little bit uh, uh, difficult for us to accept that, yes, we need to use the lower settings, but uh, the carb ratio and the algorithm, it's not age dependent, it's a dose dependent. So it means that if you have the child which is eight years old, and then you have the current, uh, then you have the total daily dose in one child 10, 20, 20 units, and the other one is 40 units per day, then in the dose, uh, the, the, the patient who is 
with a total daily dose of 20, uh, 20 units per day, maybe you have the current ratio of 11, 12, but in the other one, you can have the current ratio of seven or eight. So please consider this one because this is another important point in order to get the benefits of the 7 8 g And this is the three months data. As you can see here, we went to 78%, slightly um, uh, uh, a better glycemic control, no exits here, the GMI of 6.8. This is the six months data. The patient is using the Guardian 4 sensor, 86%, no, almost no exits here in the period. And this is the time in the ranges over the time. Now she is almost a year with the 780G. As you can see here, just in the first week with the 780G, when used the optimal settings, we achieved more than 80%, and this 80% was maintained over the, over the same period. You can see here, no hypoglycemic events. The A1C decreased below seven, it stayed below seven. As you can see, the last GMI, uh, it's the GMI because it, this is the month of 11, we don't have the three months data here, is the GMI of 6.5. The system settings were never changed. Uh, the target of 100 milligrams per deciliter and that was in two hours was used during the old times. And then we only just needed to change the current ratio from six to five. As we can see here, there is immediate improvements in the glycemic control. So what we need to analyze timing range and the A1C together to have the complete picture. Another tip that I also want to share with you is the GMI in correlations with the, with the A1C. So when we have the A1C at clinic when we are taking, this is the period of six to eight uh, uh, weeks uh, before. So it means that we have, let's say that we have the A1C of 8%. Then when using the sensor, the pump or whatever, we can calculate the GMI in the last 14 days or one month. So if the, if, if this GMI is higher, let's say it shows that it's 9.2%, it means that in the last two weeks or four weeks, we have deterioration on the control. So it means that there is a trend of deterioration of the glycemic control. It means that this patient will increase his A1C in the future. And we can use that one in order to have a closer follow up for maybe some virtual clinics. In other point, if we have the GMI, which is lower than the current one, so consider this is the regular uh, A1C, and this is the GMI for the last two to four weeks, let's say in this case, it's 7%. It means that the patient in the last period is doing much, much better. And it means that it will, uh, he will improve the glycemic control. So this is my overview, how, how we can use the GMI in correlation with the A1C to predict the A1C and the glycemic control. Uh, which patients are suitable for the minimum 780? Those with a high A1C, those with normal A1C, or A1C below seven with a hypoglycemia, or all it can be included. So maybe we'll all agree that all the patients uh, with the hypoglycemia, with the A1C, below seven, they can go. But previously we were thinking that yes, those patients who have the high A1C, maybe they are not a good candidates for the, um, uh, for the seven, uh, for the seven ATG. And usually we said, yes, uh, maybe we should postpone it. We will discuss uh, with, uh, with the cases after that. And I want just to share with you um, these information that we have provided the protocol by itself for the 780G, for the 670G, and for the 640G. All these are available online, so you can ask the uh, metronic representative uh, to give you the soft or printed, um, uh, uh, the printed copies, especially for the 780G, because all the practical tips of initiation, follow-up, changing adjustment are in this protocol it's about 30 pages so they can they can give you uh, a, a copy of this protocol uh, this is the patient with the high a1c this is the 18 years old girl as you can see here she has the a1c of 13.2 percent and in our team we were asking ourselves 
is this patient a good candidate for the 780G? The patient was motivated. We discussed a lot with this patient. We said, okay, let's see. Let's start the journey with the 780G. So look at the data here. The P period, which is the orange one, shows the multiple daily injection. She was spending only 39%. The blue stripe here is the automated insulin delivery only for the four weeks of the automation. 86%. This is the blue line here. Then on the right hand side, the six weeks, 81%, which is the orange one here. And then 98% eight weeks. So just two months after the initiation of the 780G. So those patients who have high A1C level should not be excluded uh, from the uh, from possibility to go on the advanced hybrid closed loop. But what I would like to stress here that we need to be sure to discuss and to meet the expectations of, for the patient from the system, and also to be sure that the patient will take all the responsibilities for the system, which means in this case is do the carb counting, change the infusion set, change the sensor, and um, uh, continue uh, uh, to, uh, to lead a more, more normal life with the pump. So this patient, as you can see here, was eight years old girl. A was a 7.4, fair glycemic control, even good for this age group. And we went before going on the 780G, we can see here that the A was of 67%, which correlates with the A was at 7.4, but look at the hypoglycemic events. 12% of the hypoglycemic events. One month after, we reached 79% and only 3% of the hypoglycemic events. Almost three times less hypoglycemic events just one month in the, in the automation. And then another patient, non-compliant patient. So the patient who is not adherent to the therapy, usually the patients who are forgetting the bolus, forgetting to do the calculations, sometimes they forget the, to, to give also the long-acting insulin, then this is a question that we don't want this patient to go on the 780G um, uh, to, uh, because they will be not compliant. But look at this patient. The patient has 8% of the time bridge and he didn't, we didn't put the patient on the pump because of not the adherence. Then we discussed a lot and we said, okay, let's give a try to go on the 780G. Look at the patient here. This is the GMI of 7.5, time range 51%. And look at the patient. The patient is not bolusing, 0.6 boluses per day. So it means that one bolus every second day, 23 grams are entered. So it means that in this case, we achieved the GMI around 7.5, 7.4% without bolusing. So the question now is, should we open the pump therapy for this kind of the patients, because if this patient uh, will stay on, would have stayed on this therapy, on the MDI, he will have the high A1C and it will be non-compliant. So maybe this patient can be also the good candidates. If we can work now to bolus for the meal, maybe this can be used as a motivation to improve the, 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 the bolusing, even if we can go even lower. What about the the, uh, the COVID uh, cases, if the patient is positive or uh, sick day management. So this is another case, 17 years old girl doing much, very good with the 780G. You can see here 84% with the, with the normal periods. And then she was tested positive. And she was, I can say mild to moderate symptoms of the COVID, muscle aches, loss of taste, fever, cough, and she was self-isolated. We started with some vitamins, glufen, vitamin D, and a lot of fluids. You can see here that the timing range decreased almost to 75%, so nine points here. And look at how does it look like with a lot of corrections here. So my advice is that if we have mild situation, then we can stay in the automated mode. If you stay in the automated mode, all these automatic corrections maybe they can, they can cope with the, these hyperglycemic events. If we see that the, 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 the situation is deteriorating, then we can go to the menial mode 
and to continue to use the same seedbed management for the open loop system and for the NDI patients. In the last one year, we were doing a lot of research if we can go without the carb counting. So if the patient is not doing the carb counting, if we can improve the glycemic control. Yes, with the meal announcement, and we're going to uh, present this one at the end of the presentation. Yes, we can go with the, with the meal announcement on three different meals, snacks, normal, and large. So it means that the patient will just press the button without the, without the calculation of the cars. And in this case, we can go around 70 or 75% of the time range. Another uh, observation that we have found and we, we, we published this article and also the protocol there. So the short stature and the type one diabetes, usually when we have the patient who is type one diabetic and has uh, growth hormone replacement therapy, then we are not expecting to have the good glucose control. Like in this case, the patient was in the growth hormone replacement therapy and the patient has only 23% of the good glucose control with a lot of hyperglycemia. When this patient was switched on the 780G, we achieved to go with 77%. As you can see here, more than 30% insulin was delivered as an auto-operation. So consider that if you have this kind of the patient, maybe they can benefit of the minimum 780G because we have the automated insulin delivery. This is the meal announcement. How does it look like? We performed the study. And this is actually one patient uh, from our study. In other, uh, in, in other uh, maybe meeting, we can discuss to go in details with, uh, with this uh, new protocol. As you can see here, the high A1C, she was giving the fixed boluses, estimating the curves. This is the Libra download. Usually in the afternoon, you can see here hyperglycemic spikes here, usually because of missing or not calculating the curves. Then the patient was switched on the insulin pump therapy, the open loop. So we didn't improve a lot. And you can see here this glucose variability, as you can see here that the patient is, is checking uh, uh, a lot, seven, eight, or nine times per day in order to improve the glycemic control. And then we said, okay, let's try to use this meal announcement based on the formula that we have designed. So you can see here that we use the open loop system only for the three days, and we 45% was the time in the range. And then we put on the automation with the three different um, uh, meal announcement, snack, large, and the normal meal. This is how does it look like, 83% three months. And this is on the daily view. So the patient was announcing with a preset of 20, 40, or 80 grams. So if the patient was eating a bigger plate, she will enter 80 grams. If the patient was will, will eat the normal amount of the food based on the plate estimation, it will be 40. And if the patient will take all the snack, it will just announce of 20 grams. So this patient achieved almost 83% without the hypoglycemic events. And this is how does it look like on a daily view? 40, 40, 40, 80, 40, 40, 40, 20 here. So it means that those patients who are not good in the carb counting, they can be switched with this new protocol with the meal announcement with the presets of three different meals. What was also funny from this study, there were two siblings, one 14, one 15 years old. They were recruited in the study and they, they, they went to the fixed study with the meal announcement. As you can see here that the both of them, they decreased the A1C to 6.6 .6 and to 6.9. After the study, they asked because we said it will be optional if you want to use the, 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 this fixed meal uh, management. And then one of the sibling, that, uh, uh, he said that, yes, I want to continue with the same one because I am in a good control. I don't want to, um, uh, to change because I have a good glucose control and I'm fine. And then the other one decided to go with the flexible, with the precise carb count. After three months, the patient who was using the fixed carb counting with these presets, has the, uh, he has the A1C at 6.5. The other one slightly increased the A1C to 7.2. And then the girl decided to go back to the fixed regimen to this um, fixed carb counting. And now we're going to see next month when they will come back 
to see what is the evaluation of the of this uh, of this uh, system um, the changes. So what is the time the range of the progression of the therapy? And here we, I think that we can we can almost end the presentation and to, in order to have more more time for the uh, uh, for the uh, questions and answers. So usually when we have the patient with the MD and the SMBG, we will have time range about 40 to 50 percent. If we're using the insulin pump and the CGM, we can go slightly above 50 percent. If you're using the MDI and the CGM, these are adults, they can go up to 60% in order of 57%. If you're using the uh, closed loop system, basal or basal plus uh, bolus corrections, like the minimum 7 ATG, we can achieve around 80%. And I'm a big believer that if we use the automated insulin delivery, that we can, we can go even beyond around 80, 85% in most of our patients, those who are compliant with the therapy. Now let's uh, let's hear what is one of our patients, what uh, she is uh, uh, commenting about the 7 ATG. Ever since I've gone on the new pump, I've been able to eat a lot of different foods, such as cereal in particular, since with the old pump, I wasn't really, I would try to particularly avoid those kind of foods since they would send my levels absolutely skyrocketing. But now with the new pump, I'm able to eat it more more often now without my levels going crazy. And another food that has been introduced to my taste palette is jam, a uh, toast of jam, which would send me up to like 15 if my levels were not right so yeah the new pump's been great so this is my last slide and you can see here that you know this this child actually we are talking about the quality of life we all know we have presented that the 7 ABG, the ultimate insulin delivery yes they can improve the glycemic control for sure but we also want to improve their quality of life thank you for your time and i think that we have still time for the uh, uh, comments and the questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Goran Petroski, for this uh, amazing illustration of, uh, of this system. It is just really amazing. And probably for those category, uh, had, when you illustrated later, for those fully controlled or not really so strict with the carb counting. This is this is amazing turning point to, to, to such category of patients. And we have, we have some questions, we can go through them closely. So probably in the, uh, as far as the last part been uh, concerning, there was a question regarding the, uh, the meal announcement function, which I think you explained really well. So probably if you would like to stress on it more, yes. uh, so to explain meal announcement function, in yes. more details. Yes, actually, you know, the, the history of this meal announcement started maybe when we started to use the 780G. And it started on those who were poorly controlled. And I have shown several slides that, you know, if sometimes if you miss the bolus, then you can have, uh, the, with auto correction, it can go back to the normal. Some of the patients were reporting that, yes, I don't do the proper carb counting, and they still have the good glycemic control. And then we said, okay, why don't we try to find out uh, uh, to, to have a new protocol for, uh, and to reach the pumps in those who cannot do the proper carb counting. So it means that the patients, because we have social economics situations, some patients are not literate to do the, the, the proper carb counting because the, the, they, they have, the, the, there is a limitation in the knowledge. And we said, let's try to to see if we can go with this meal announcement without the carb counting. So we performed the randomized control trial and uh, with all this meal, the fixed meal announcement, one group was with the fixed meals. It means with the meal announcement with, the, with the three different presets and the other one was uh, with the precise carb counting. The calculation, because we don't have time you know, to explain in details how we set the, the, the sets. 
but usually it goes for the snack around 20 grams. Uh, main meal, the normal meal is about 50 grams and the other one is 80 or 90 grams. So we have the formula which calculates and fine tune all these three meals. So we found that those who were announcing the meal by pressing the preset button, 20, 60, or 80, or 15, 40, and 60, they have the timing range of 73% and the A1C of 6.8. Comparing to those with a precise car counting of 6.6 .6 and timing range of almost 80%. So it means that those patients who cannot do the carb counting, still they can have the good glycemic control uh, without the proper carb count. Now, we are changing the setting in our clinic. It means that uh, it's proven that if you're doing the proper carb counting, then that you will have the, A1, the, the timing range of 80%. But if you cannot do the proper carb counting with this meal announcement, then you can be above 70, 75% of the timing range and still you can achieve the better glycemic control. So it means that we are going to we are going to the, the, make the two different drugs for our patients. Right. Uh, I have myself a question actually uh, uh, back to this study that you have uh, conducted and illustrated here really well. When considering uh, uh, the, uh, the insulin carb ratio uh, and down sometimes to even five. So have, have you studied also the anthropometric in terms of BMI later on and how much uh, the daily uh, insulin requirement kind of the maximum uh, insulin requirement uh, that in, 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 uh, in order to reach to your targets? So actually, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, what we found that both groups slightly increased the insulin dose to 1.1 unit per unit uh, per, per, per kg. So it means that it's, uh, there, is no, there was no significant difference of the total daily insulin do dose there was only difference in the distribution of the insulin. So those patients who were doing the fixed meal announcement without carb counting, they have almost the double amount of the corrections comparing to those uh, who were doing the precise carb counting. Because we have used the optimal settings, this was the requirement for the pump, for the, uh, for the study to use the two hours and uh, lack insulin time, and also the target of 100 milligram per deciliter with the lower carb ratio of 360 rule, we didn't find any hypoglycemic events in both groups. It was below 2%, I can, I can recall, and there was no differences in the total daily dose between the groups. Great, great. Uh, also, probably in the same uh, way, is there any maximum basal correction per hour in is uh, in smart guard mode? If it is, yes, can we increase it? This is one, one question. Yes, actually the maximum basal correction there is only for the algorithm. So it means that usually in my two years working with the 780G, yes, two, 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 currently two years, I have never seen the maximum basal correction that it was given because it will kick you out from the uh, from the smart guard. So this maximum basal, basal or minimum correction, uh, minimum basal, minimum bolus corrections that are set, they are by the algorithm by itself. And it's changing on the daily basis. From the algorithm, from the user perspective, it only can be shown on the pump because this was reached, and then you can check the glucose levels by the regular glucometer in order to continue to deliver or not to deliver the insulin. So the algorithm actually just want to be uh, to be confirmed that this is the real glucose values that are connected with the high or the, with the minimum on the or, or the uh, maximum uh, basal insulin deliver. So it's only from the user perspective. Okay, yeah. I don't know if that is, uh, could answer this question also. Uh, yes. I, I'll just read through it. What do we mean by maximum autobasal after which autocorrection starts? And what is the difference between the autocorrection and making the autobasal target of 6.7? Yes. So, so fine. And then later, how many maximum autobasal and autocorrection together possible in one hour? 
Yeah, it's really, you know, this is this is a good point, you know, to uh, to to discuss. And I would like to show you somewhere. Yes, this is the one. This is the slide that it's it's real. So this is the glucose level. So these are the time, and these are the glucose levels, and this is the curves that are going. So we can set the target. Let's say 100, 100, and then 120 milligrams per, per deciliter. So the pump every five minutes is giving this auto basal insulin delivery. So if we can say that if we set it to 100 milligram per deciliter, if the glucose is around 100, 110, 120, sometimes 130, the pump will continue with the auto basal insulin delivery in order to decrease it back to the normal. By algorithm, by itself, even the algorithm, the basal algorithm, it's trying to get to the normal glucose values. Sometimes it's not possible because maybe the patient didn't bolus for the food or miscalculate the carbs. So in, in this case, and if the glucose levels goes more than 120 milligram per deciliter, doesn't matter if we have set the target to 100 milligram per deciliter, then all when the glucose levels are more than 120, the pump always will consider to give these automatic corrections to decrease it to 120 milligram. And then from 120, the basal will take slowly to go back to the normal. So this is how actually the algorithm works for. In some period, you can see no basal insulin delivery. So let's see, like in this case here, Look at here, the glucose values were high. The pump was giving the basal corrections here. Uh, there was decrease here to 100 milligram per deciliter. And even before reaching 100, you can see here no bolus, no, no insulin at all. When the glucose was stabilized here around 4.30 in the morning, even on 100 milligram per deciliter, pump delivered a small amount of the basals. So then, when the glucose will start to go higher here, probably because it's, it was missed meal here, but it, the, meal, the meal was missed maybe 20, 30 grams, the pump start to push first with the basal and then with this, this auto corrections here. So this is how actually the algorithm works for it. Right. Uh, I think uh, we are actually we have more questions, probably a suggestion by our uh, dietitian uh, Adij al uh, saying that I think to give them fixed carbs and mean meals every day, then we can use meal announcement. So probably like... Uh, yes, this is another yeah. good point, but you know, uh, uh, from the dietetics uh, point of view, can the patient eat the same amount of the carbs per day so let's say that every morning you will eat 40 grams. Every, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the snack, it will be 30 grams. For the, uh, for the dinner, it will be 80 grams, let's say. So it's a very difficult, but this meal announcement with the presets, it's working. So it means that you can achieve around 70, 75% of the time. Limit. Sometimes we can go more than 80%. But the point of our study was that to reach those patients who are not knowledgeable with the carb counting. Of course, this pump is not intended to be used without the meal announcement, without the precise carb counting. We took it uh, beyond that one and the publication will come in the next three to four weeks because it's accepted for the publication. And then we can share, we can share it, you know, the full protocol in details. Yeah, um, there was no, no one one uh, question around whether there is any more lectures in, in, in this um, uh, field, actually, uh, or probably just one, but that we can liaise with the uh, organizing uh, part, yes. Uh, yes. organizing part with that. Uh, and I think by, by now we are reaching to the end of this uh, um, evening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for your enlightenment in, in such an interesting field. And uh, we extend our uh, thanks to uh, Meditronic organizing this um, evening session for us today. And I would like to thank all uh, who stayed uh, till the end. Uh, uh, 
attendees and uh, the uh, organized uh, organization by Oman Diabetes Association as well. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening. Thank you for this kind of invitation and we'll continue, I hope, you know, uh, let's maybe to go online also face-to-face. -face. Thank you, have a nice week, a nice evening. Thank you, thank you very much.